Hi, I believe this is part six of Oh That Mo. And uh, what I'm doing is um, taping off of the internet, off of YouTube. And uh, if you can't see the, uh, the Hadith and the Quran scriptures that are being presented here in this uh, uh, video, I'm providing the link. Uh, if, it's, it's, if it's live link, it's probably up. If it's uh, YouTube, it's probably below. And you can click on it and go to the original and see it. So you can say, oh, you can see that we're not reading into things or taking things. Well, <laughs> let's put it this way. You click on it and you'll be able to see where the Islamic sources, the Hadith and the Quran, the Sunnah, uh, came from to make this video, okay? So I'll begin it here. All right. Two earliest extant and most reliable biographies of Alexander the Great were written by horns on his head, which is significant since, again, dual cornein means two horns. Third, Arabs like Al-Asha, who was a poet living shortly prior to Muhammad, and Hassan ibn Thabit, who was contemporary with Muhammad, called Alexander the Great dual cornein. Thus, the expert on Alexander the Great, Richard Stoneman, affirms, quote, the two names, Alexander the Great and Dual Cornane, were already synonymous when Muhammad came to compose this surah of the Quran. In fact, modern scholars have shown the Quranic story of this Dual Cornane in Surah 18 actually comes from the pre-Islamic mythical Syriac source called A Christian Legend Concerning Alexander, translated into English by Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge in 1889. When one compares the Quranic story in Surah 18, to the Syriac tale of Alexander the Great side by side, there is no question this is where the Quran got the Alexander fable. There are more than 11 similar features between the two stories, such as Alexander having two horns, being given power, the sun rising on the people with no cover, punishment of the unrighteous, Gog and Magog spoiling the land, and the building of a wall as a defense. As Stoneman notes, quote, the commentators on the Quran universally assume that Dual Quranain here in Surah 18 is the name of Alexander. Their assumption was clearly correct, since the two stories here in Surah 18 associated with Dual Quranain are precisely those two stories associated with Alexander in the Syriac legend of Alexander, current shortly before the composition of the Quran. This proves unequivocally the Quran is not of divine origin, but instead stole earlier uninspired mythical stories or legends. Moreover, Surah 18 also proves the Quran is historically inaccurate for claiming Alexander the Great was a righteous man who believed in and obeyed Allah. For the historical evidence concerning Alexander the Great shows he was actually an unrighteous polytheistic pagan. The two earliest extant and most reliable biographies of Alexander the Great were written by Arian and Plutarch. According to Arian, quote, Alexander offered sacrifice on the following day to the gods who had revealed the signs and assured him, unquote. Similarly, Plutarch relayed, quote, the empire of the Persians was thought to be utterly dissolved and Alexander, proclaimed king of Asia, made magnificent sacrifices to the gods, unquote. Arian also reported, quote, I pity Alexander for his mishap because on that occasion he showed himself the slave of two vices, anger and drunkenness." Unquote. Finally, Plutarch relayed Alexander engaged in drunken homosexual acts. Quote, he, Alexander, was once viewing some contests in singing and dancing, being well heated with wine, and that his favorite, Bagoas, won the prize for song and dance, and then, all in his festal array, passed through the theater and took his seat by Alexander's side at sight of which the Macedonians clapped their hands and loudly bade the king kiss the victor, until at last he threw his arms about him and kissed him tenderly." Unquote. An example of a scientific error in the Quran can be found in Surah 596. According to that passage, Muslims can eat anything that swims in, in the, the seas or the oceans, the waters, and this is in contrast to other foods that Allah has forbidden. However, if this verse is true, then it would be okay, there'd be no problem in eating things like uh, stonefish, pufferfish, or blowfish, a triggerfish, 
uh, poison dark frog, barracuda, a marble cone snail, all of these things are poisonous uh, for human beings, and yet Allah says, eat up. Uh, that's a very clear scientific error. The Quran claims mountains were placed down onto earth as pegs. Quran 31.10 says, quote, He has created the heavens without any pillars that you can see, and he has placed in the earth firm mountains that it may not quake with you, unquote. Quran 78.6-7 also says, Have we not made the earth as a bed, and the mountains as pegs, unquote? Darya Badi translates the last Arabic word as stakes. These texts teach the way mountains appeared was that God placed them down onto earth from the sky, like pegs or stakes. The scientific problem is mountains are actually formed by tectonic plates colliding together. As we read in the science book, Physical Geography, quote, The world's highest mountains, the Himalayas, were formed when the Indian plate collided with the Eurasia. The Alps were formed in a similar manner in a collision between the African and Eurasian plates." Unquote. Muhammad taught the traits of children are determined by which parent climaxes first during sexual intercourse. Muhammad said, quote, As for the resemblance of the child to its parents, if a man has sexual intercourse with his wife and gets discharged first, the child will resemble the father, and if the woman gets discharged first, the child will resemble her." Unquote. This is a serious scientific error proving Muhammad was a false prophet. In other words, the moral of the story is, if you want your child to look like you, or be a clone of you, don't do foreplay with the wife. And if you want, if your wife is really hot, and you want to make a clone of her, do for a play with the wife and resist ejaculation. A child's traits are determined by genes inherited by the mother and the father, and it has nothing to do with who climaxes first during sexual intercourse. As one modern science textbook on heredity points out, quote, every person has two copies of most genes in their genome. One copy of the gene comes from their mother, and the other one comes from their father. The two copies of the genes are not exactly the same. They contain small changes in the sequence of DNA bases. These two different versions of the same gene are called alleles. The small differences in the alleles cause offspring to resemble their parents without looking exactly the same as either parent. An example of a mathematical error in the Quran arises from Surah 4 verses 11 through 12 where we're given the inheritance law in Islam. And so if you read that passage, the way it works out is, for example, if a person left a wife, two daughters, a father and a mother behind, then the wife would get one-eighth of the inheritance, the daughters would get two-thirds, the father would get one-sixth, and the mother would get one-sixth. And if you do the math, it comes out to, uh, I think it's 27 24 which of course doesn't jive. That is, they're due to inherit more than the person actually has. The Quran falsely teaches the New Testament Virgin Mary was the sister of the Old Testament figure Aaron, and that she was the daughter of Imran, who was Aaron's father. The reason the Quran made this serious mistake was because Aaron's sister was also called Mary, just like Jesus' mother was, and Muhammad therefore confused the two. This historical error shows the Quran is not inspired by God. Muslims offer different unconvincing responses to this, but the Muslim scholar Muhammad Asad claims the Quran only referred to Mary's ancestral relationship to Aaron when it called her the sister of Aaron. However, this response won't work because Quran 3, 35-38 explicitly says the wife of Imran, i.e. Aaron's mother, literally gave birth to Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Quran 1886, which, as we noted, concerns Alexander the Great, we read, quote, Until when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. Near it he found a people, unquote. This is clearly a scientific error since the sun does not and is not small enough to set in a spring of water. In response, Islamic commentator Malana Daryabadi argues the Arabic word for found here, wajada, 
should be taken in a subjective sense, meaning he perceived it setting in water. Even though Daryabadi admits the word can have an objective meaning corresponding to fact, i.e. he found it setting in water. However, Daryabadi is mistaken because right after this verse says Alexander found the sun setting in water, it then continues and says he also found a people, using the same Arabic word for found, wajada. Thus, according to the Quran, the same way Alexander literally found a people, he literally found the sun setting in water. And lastly, in a sound hadith in Sunan Abu Dawud, Muhammad said the sun literally sets in water, not that it's only perceived to do such. Quote, Narrated Abu Dar, I was sitting behind the messenger of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, Do you know where the sun sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water, unquote. The Quran is full of other logical errors or contradictions. Okay, um, if you're a Muslim and you think this guy is lying, put your comments here and we'll study it and see if he is taking things out of context or twisting things, okay? So, anyway, uh, end of this part of Oh that all oh that Maha oh that Mo. Bye.